Hipparchus by Plato, translated by George Burgess. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. Persons of the Dialogue Socrates and a Friend. Socrates, what is the love of gain, and who are its lovers? Friend, they seem to me to be those who think it worth while to make a gain from what is nothing worth. Socrates, whether then do they seem to you to do so, while knowing that the things are of no worth, or not knowing? For if they do so not knowing, you call the lovers of gain senseless. Friend, nay, I do not call them senseless, but thorough knaves and villains, the slaves of gain, and who know indeed that the things are worthless from which they dare to make a gain, but yet through their shamelessness they dare to have a love of gain. Socrates, do you then call a person of this kind a lover of gain? For instance, should a husbandman, while planting, and knowing the plant to be worthless, nevertheless think to make a gain from it when grown up, do you call such a person a lover of gain? Friend, the lover of gain, Socrates, thinks he ought to make a gain from everything. Socrates, do not thus answer me at random, like a person injured by someone, but, giving your mind, answer me as if I were questioning you again from the beginning. Do you not agree with me that a lover of gain knows the value of that from which he thinks it worth while to make a gain? Friend, I do. Socrates, who then is he that knows the value of plants, and in what time and place it is worth while to plant them, that we also may introduce something from the words of the wise, which the clever in lawsuits employ for the sake of elegance? Friend, a husbandman, I think. Socrates, do you then mean by the expression, it is worth while to make a gain, anything else than to think that one ought to make a gain? Friend, I mean this. Socrates, now, do not you, who are so young, endeavour to deceive me, your elder, by answering, as you do at present, what you do not think? But tell me truly, do you think that a husbandman exists, who knows it is not worth while to plant a certain plant, and yet fancies he will make a gain by such a plant? Friend, by Zeus, not I. Socrates, what then? Think you that a horse-dealer, who knows that the food which he gives a horse is of no worth, does not know that it destroys the horse? Friend, I do not. Socrates, he does not think, then, that from such worthless food he will make a gain? Friend, he does not. Socrates, what, then, do you think that a pilot who has furnished his ship with sails and a rudder of no worth does not know that he will sustain a damage and be in danger of perishing himself, and of losing the ship and all it carries? Friend, I do not. Socrates, he will not think, then, that he will make a gain by worthless articles? Friend, he will not. Socrates, but does the general, who knows that his army carries worthless arms, think he will make a gain, or that he is worthy to make a gain by them? Friend, by no means. Socrates, but if a hoboy player possesses a worthless hoboy, or a liar player a liar, or a bowman a bow, or in short any other artist or skilled person possesses instruments or any other apparatus of no value, does he think he will make a gain by these? Friend, it appears he will not. Socrates, whom then do you call lovers of gain? For surely they are not those whom we have already mentioned, who, knowing what are things of no value, think they must make a gain by them. And thus, a wonderful man, according to what you say, no one is a lover of gain. Friend, but Socrates, I mean to say that those are lovers of gain who, through insatiable avidity, are perpetually and beyond all measure greedy after things that are small and worth little or nothing, and thus have a love of gain. Socrates, but surely, thou best of men, they do not know this, that they are worthless, for we have proved against ourselves that this is impossible. Friend, so it seems to me. Socrates, if, then, they do so, not knowing it, it is evident that, not knowing it, they fancy things of no worth to be of great value. Friend, it appears so. Socrates, 
do not the lovers of gain love gain friend yes socrates but do you say that gain is contrary to loss friend i do socrates is it therefore a good to any one to suffer a loss friend to no one socrates but it is an evil friend yes socrates are men then injured by a damage friend they are injured socrates is then damage an evil friend it is socrates but gain is contrary to damage friend contrary socrates gain is therefore a good friend it is socrates do you then call those who love a good lovers of gain friend it seems so socrates you do not then my friend call the lovers of gain madmen but do you yourself love what is a good or not love it friend i do socrates is there a good which you do not love but an evil which you do friend by zeus there is not socrates but you love all good things equally friend i do socrates ask me if i also do not for i also shall acknowledge to you that i love good things but besides i and you do not all the rest of men appear to you to love good things and to hate evil friend to me it appears so socrates but have we not acknowledged that gain is a good friend yes socrates in this way then all appear to be lovers of gain but that in which we before mentioned no one was a lover of gain by employing then which assertion would a person not err friend should socrates when rightly apprehend what a lover of gain is i think it is right to consider him a lover of gain who earnestly applies himself to and thinks it worth while to make a gain from those things from which the good do not dare to make a gain socrates but do you not see o sweetest of men that we just now acknowledged that to make a gain is to be benefited friend what then socrates because this also we previously admitted that all men always wished for good things friend we did socrates do not then good men wish to possess everything gainful since such things are good friend but not the thing socrates by which they are about to be hurt socrates by to be hurt do you mean to be damaged or something else friend no but i mean to be damaged socrates are persons damaged by gain or by damage friend through both for they are damaged by damage and through iniquitous gain socrates does it then appear to you that anything useful and good is iniquitous friend to me it does not socrates did we not then a little before acknowledge that gain is contrary to damage which is an evil friend we did socrates and that being contrary to evil it is a good friend we granted this socrates you endeavour then you see to deceive me by designedly asserting the contrary to what we just now granted friend by zeus i do not socrates but you on the contrary are deceiving me and i know not how in your reasonings you turn things topsy-turvy socrates speak fair words for i should not act correctly if i were not persuaded by a man good and wise friend who is he and why particularly say you this socrates my fellow-citizen and likewise yours hipparchus the son of pisistratus one of the philidae and the eldest and wisest of the sons of pisistratus who exhibited many other illustrious acts of wisdom and was the first who introduced into this land the poems of homer and compelled the rhapsodists during the panathenia to go through them successively and in order just as you know they do at present and having sent for anacreon the teian a ship of fifty oars brought him to this city and always had about him simonides of chaos having induced him to stay by great rewards and gifts and this he did wishing to instruct the citizens in order that he might rule over them being the best of men not thinking that he ought to begrudge wisdom to any man as being himself a highly educated person 
and when such of the citizens as were living around the town had been educated well and admired him for his wisdom he likewise laid down a plan to instruct those in the country and he set up for them statues of hermes along the roads in the middle of the city and of each of the wards and afterwards selecting from his wisdom on points he had partly learned and partly discovered himself what he deemed to be the cleverest idea he put them into elegiac verses and engraved them on the hermi as his poems and specimens of wisdom in order that in the first place the citizens might not wonder at those wise inscriptions on the temple at delphi know thyself and nothing too much and the rest of that kind but that they might deem the words of hipparchus still wiser and in the next place that passing by them up and down they might read them and have a taste of his wisdom and come from the fields and be instructed in the remaining branches of learning and there are two epigrams in some upon the left-hand sides of each of the hermi there is sculptured a hermes saying that he was standing midway between the city and the ward and in others upon the right-hand sides he says this is the memorial of hipparchus go on having just thoughts there are also many other beautiful poetical descriptions on other hermai and there is this in the steriac road in which he says this is the memorial of hipparchus do not deceive your friend i would not then have dared to deceive you being my friend and disobey so great a man after whose death the athenians were tyrannized over by his brother hippias and you have heard from all the old men that only during those years did there exist a tyranny at athens and that during all the other period the athenians lived nearly as when saturn reigned but it is said by rather clever persons that he did not die in the way which the multitude have thought through the dishonour done to the sister of harmodius respecting the carrying the sacred basket for that is a silly reason but that harmodius was the bosom friend and pupil of aristogaton who valued himself highly upon instructing a man and fancied that hipparchus would be his rival but at that time it happened that harmodius was the lover of one of the handsome and nobly born youths whose name persons have mentioned but i do not remember and that this young person did for a time admire harmodius and aristogaton as wise men but afterwards associating with hipparchus he despised them and that they being very much annoyed at the dishonour slew hipparchus friend you run the risk socrates of either not considering me a friend or if you do think me a friend of not being persuaded by hipparchus for i cannot be persuaded that you have not deceived me in i know not what manner during the discourse socrates but indeed just as in the game of backgammon i am willing to put back whatever part you please of the assertions already made in order that you may not think you have been deceived whether therefore shall i retract this assertion for you that all men desire good friend not for me socrates but that to be damaged and damage itself is not an evil friend not for me socrates but that gain and to make a gain are not contrary to damage and to be damaged friend nor this neither socrates but that to make a gain as being contrary to evil is not a good friend retract nothing of this kind at all for me socrates it appears to you then as it seems that of gain one part is a good and another an evil friend yes to me socrates i retract therefore this for you for let it be that one kind of gain is a good and another kind an evil but that gain itself is not more good than evil is it not so friend why do you ask me socrates i will tell you is there food good and bad friend yes socrates is therefore one of them more food than the other or are both of them similarly food and does the one differ in no respect from the other so far as each is food but so far as one is good and the other bad friend just so 
Socrates, and is it not, as regards drink, and all other things which are parts of things existing, that some at least are so circumstanced as to be bad, and others good, and that they differ not at all from each other, in that they are the same, just as one man is good, and another bad? Friend, yes. Socrates, but one man is, I suppose, neither more nor less a man than another, neither the good than the bad, nor the bad than the good. Friend, you speak the truth. Socrates, shall we not then think in like manner respecting gain, that both the good and the bad are similarly gain? Friend, it is necessary. Socrates, he therefore who has a good gain does not in any respect make a gain more than he who has a bad gain, for neither of these, as we have granted, appears to be more a gain than the other. Friend, true. Socrates, for to neither of them is the more or the less present. Friend, it is not. Socrates, but in a thing of this kind, to which neither of these accidents is present, how can any one do, or suffer, more or less? Friend, it is impossible. Socrates, since then both are similarly gain and gainful, it is requisite that we should still further consider this. Why do you call both of them gain? And, what do you see to be in both the same? Just as if you had asked me about the recent question, why I called both good and bad food similarly food, I would have said, because each is a dry element of the body. On this account I called them so. For that this is food you would surely acknowledge, would you not? Friend, I would. Socrates, and there will be the same manner of answering respecting drink that for the moist element of the body, whether it is good or bad, the name is drink, and for the rest of things in like manner. Do you therefore endeavour to imitate me by answering thus? When you speak of good gain and bad gain as being both of them gain, what same thing do you perceive in them that this too is gain? But if you are not able to answer me in this way, reflect, while I am speaking, do you call a gain every acquisition that a person obtains, when he either spends nothing, or when, after spending less, he receives more? Friend, I seem to myself to call the latter gain. Socrates, are you therefore speaking of such things as these? If a person, after having been feasted and spending nothing, and indulging in good living, should become diseased? Friend, not I by Zeus. Socrates, but if he should obtain health after feasting, would he obtain a gain or damage? Friend, gain. Socrates, this, then, is not a gain, to obtain any acquisition whatever. Friend, it is not. Socrates, whether will he, who obtains what is an evil, or at least what is not a good, not obtain a gain? Friend, it appears so, at least, if it be a good. Socrates, but if he obtains an evil, will he not obtain a damage? Friend, to me it appears so. Socrates, see then how you are again running round to the same point, for gain appears to be a good, but damage an evil. Friend, I really am at a loss what to say. Socrates, nor unjustly are you at a loss, but answer me still further this. If any one, after having spent less, obtains more, do you say this is a gain? Friend, I do not say it is an evil, but if, after having spent less of gold or silver money, he receives more. Socrates, I too am about to ask you this, for come, tell me, should a person spending half a pound of gold receive double this weight of silver, would he obtain a gain or a damage? Friend, a damage, surely, Socrates, for instead of a value twelve times as much, the silver is only twice as much, Socrates, but yet he has received more, or is not double more than half, friend, but silver is not of the same value as gold, Socrates, it is requisite then, as it seems, that this, namely value, be added to gain, for in this case do you not say that the silver, although being more than the gold, is not of equal value? The gold, although being less, you say, is of equal value. Friend, very much so, 
for such is the fact, Socrates. Value, therefore, is gainful, whether it is small or great, but that which is valueless is gainless? Friend, yes, Socrates, by value do you mean anything else than what it is worthy to acquire? Friend, I do not, Socrates, but by the expression it is worthy to acquire, do you mean the useless or the useful? Friend, the useful, certainly, Socrates. The useful, therefore, is a good? Friend, yes, Socrates. Hence, thou most manly of all men, has not the lucrative come to us again a third or a fourth time as being an acknowledged good? Friend, so it seems, Socrates. Do you remember, then, from whence this discourse of ours originated? Friend, I think I do. Socrates, if you do not, I will remind you. You contend it that good men are not willing to make every kind of gain, but of gains the good alone, but not the iniquitous. Friend, it did originate from this. Socrates, but has not reason forced us to acknowledge that all kinds of gain, both small and great, are good? Friend, it has forced me, Socrates, rather than persuaded. Socrates, but perhaps after this it will also persuade you. Now, however, whether you are persuaded, or in whatever manner you may be affected, you agree at least with us that all kinds of gain are good, both small and great? Friend, I do agree. Socrates, and do you agree with me, or not, that all good men wish for all things that are good? Friend, I do. Socrates, but you said that bad men love gain of every kind, both small and great. Friend, I did say so. Socrates, according to your assertion, then, all men, both good and bad, would be lovers of gain. Friend, it appears so. Socrates, if, then, any person reproaches another with being a lover of gain, he does not correctly reproach him, for the very person so reproaching happens to be such a character himself. End of Hipparchus